Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm especially grateful to be able to talk after Jose and also after Ruben because I think this talk goes very much in the same line, although it's quite complementary, uh, hoping not to overlap with uh, what they talk about. And well, I also hope that uh, I will be able to uh, keep you awake. Uh, probably you're all very hungry already, but anyway. So I wanted to uh, start by the acknowledgements because I think it's maybe the most important part of this kind of interdisciplinary research. So today we'll talk about mathematical model of disease, but this work uh, has only been possible due to the uh, interplay between many different actors from many different disciplines and many different institutions. So particularly I want to thank, uh, well, the people here at uh, UNAM, uh, both my um, uh, uh, PI and uh, collaborators and students, uh, people in UK uh, with whom I started um, most of the work or some of the work I will talk about today, people in Japan who are also experimental collaborators and a dermatologist who has been pivotal in a part of this work. So, uh, so I will first want to uh, start talking about the motivation of this work. I am really interested as a biologist in understanding uh, complex diseases with the aim to try to improve the health of, well, Mexicans, but uh, in general uh, in this world. So as we know here, um, complex diseases are a very important uh, health problem and particularly complex epithelial tissue diseases, including infections which uh, most times happen in the mucosal surfaces or in, uh, in the gut, etc., uh, are one of these uh, diseases, cancer and some chronic respiratory diseases. So this kind of diseases comprise a very good propor uh, big proportion of the causes of death, both in Mexico and worldwide. So it's a very urgent health problem to try to tackle this. So, uh, why epithelial tissues and what are the role in health and diseases? So this goes very much in line with uh, the talk that just uh, passed. So epithelial tissues uh, basically protect us from environments, um, from microbiota or aggressive pathogens. They prevent the exchange of nutrients and uh, water or control the exchange of nutrients and water. But when they are not functioning correctly, then uh, they can uh, lose this regulatory uh, functions, lead to the infiltration of pathogens, uh, cytokine infiltration leading to inflammation, and importantly also phenotypic alteration which can manifest itself as uh, very severe diseases including carcinomas. So it's very important to try to understand uh, causes the maintenance of homeostasis of these complex uh, tissues and how this uh, homeostasis can be lost. So this is the key question when we try to address when, what are the, how can uh, epithelial function be lost in many of the diseases I'm, I will be talking about, such as infection, carcinoma, and many, some other milder diseases. So basically the key question from a complex systems perspective maybe is how to achieve this transition from a healthy to a disease state where of course we can have many healthy and many disease states because the systems are very plastic. How this transition is triggered by different combinations of genetic and environmental risk factors and most importantly, how can we prevent this transition by uh, early treatments and in the worst case scenario, how can we reverse? So I think we can phrase the question about how to improve uh, quality of, uh, of life with um, affected by epithelial tissue diseases by posing uh, conceptually this question. So how can this dynamic trajectory of pathogenesis be modulated both by risk factors and by treatments? And why is this a challenging uh, task, or why is this still, uh, in many cases, an open question? So basically because most of these uh, 
diseases uh, are controlled or are triggered by underlying regulatory networks which are quite complex in nature in the sense that they are very much uh, interconnected. And because of this complexity of these underlying regulatory networks, meaning um, connections between cells and biomolecules and even um, sometimes tissues and organs, uh, basically we have that there are many possible risk factor combinations that can trigger the onset of the disease. Also that there is a synergism between risk factors, meaning that we have nonlinear effects, um, so potentiating uh, the onset of disease in the presence of more than one factor. We have also many possible negative side effects of treatments, also due to the propagation of uh, affecting one part of the network to other maybe healthy parts of the system. And finally, we have a gradual disease aggravation also due to the propagation of the uh, perturbations due to the, its internal logic. And uh, because of this, also in line with the previous talk, we have a, a push, pushing need of um, finding uh, better early warning signals to halt this disease progression. Um, so here we do systems biology. So both, uh, well, I do uh, uh, bottom-up but also top-down approaches, which basically consists on an interplay between uh, experimental and clinical data and mathematical and computational modeling. And this is really, really important because to us, uh, real health problems, it's very, very important to work very closely with experimentalists and clinicians. So we need to use real data, um, what, whichever is available, and integrate and analyze this data with the, uh, using mathematical and computational models. So once we have these uh, mathematical models, what can we do with those? So we can do perturbation analysis, robustness assessment, and treatment optimization, which, as you see, can help us to answer most of these uh, open questions in terms of um, prevention, early detection, and treatment of those diseases. And once we have uh, predictions from this model, we can then go back to empirical studies, so either uh, for example, by experimental design or uh, reanalyzing some existing data sets. So um, in, with this um, in mind, I have been working with, on several different complex epithelial tissue diseases, uh, with, always with the aim to understand, prevent, and treat them. So um, I will try to give you a tour de force and talk very briefly about uh, most of them, if not uh, all. Some of them are still a work in progress, which I think are the most uh, exciting ones, at least for me. So basically, uh, previously, uh, before coming to, back to Mexico, I worked for some years on atopic dermatitis, which is also a complex epithelial disease, although uh, people don't usually die from it, from it, but it's still very, very interesting to uh, analyze. Also with uh, pneumonia, and more recently, with more complex and more um, dangerous diseases, such as uh, different kinds of carcinomas, uh, both of stratified epithelial systems and of secretory epithelial uh, systems, psoriasis, and also fungal infections. So these projects have been done uh, uh, in the lab of Dr. Uh, Alvarez Buya, who is uh, here, I'm glad about that. And this work here was done in the lab of Dr. Tanaka at Imperial College. So the pipeline of uh, all these uh, projects or all these models goes as follows. So first, we have to start by defining the system we're going to work with. And this is a non-trivial question, as you can imagine. And I'm very glad that Jose talked this morning uh, about uh, bottom-up versus top-down approaches because I completely agree with him that one of the big challenges is to be able, so we have to start by defining a system, a system that makes sense and ideally that is also backed up by experimental data. And for this, we can use many different types of resources. For example, this high quality, high throughput data uh, can be very useful. Um, I think it should be complemented by some more detailed molecular studies, uh, but definitely we need 
plenty of data for this, and ideally some expertise from people who know a lot about the system, for example, clinicians or experimentalists who, uh, as they have been working with it for a long time, they are experts, and they know much more than what the papers or the raw data says. So we have the system uh, which, um, on which we integrate plenty of empirical data, we then can move on to formalize this system. So I guess, again, I want to highlight the fact that this is a very, very challenging task, and many times um, a lot of the actual modeling, um, well, doesn't stop here, but we can spend plenty of time here, and it's already very insightful to construct or define these systems or these networks. So once we have these uh, networks, we can then proceed to formalize them into a uh, nonlinear dynamical system. Which one exactly? It will depend. So which formalism we will choose will very much depend on the question, on the number of variables of the system, and the resolution of the variables, and uh, the dimensionality of the measurements. But in general, um, at least I have been working with nonlinear dynamical systems, mainly differential equations and uh, more recently Boolean networks. So once we have this mathematical model, we can do plenty of interesting stuff. For example, uh, perturbation analysis of many different kinds, including um, bifurcation analysis. People have already been uh, talking about this sort of analysis in previous talks. And this proves to be very useful to uh, answer the question about what the role of different combination of risk factors is in the onset and progression of disease. We can also, with this kind of analysis, uh, try to uh, stratify the patients by uh, evaluating the variability in, for example, parameters or interactions or model structure and what the consequences of this variability is, both in phenotype and in susceptibility to disease development, uh, treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we can also use this kind of uh, analysis to try to uh, find new um, possible triggers of the disease, for example, by doing sensitivity analysis and things like that. So once we have this uh, characterization of the model, we have already many or we can have many new hypotheses or how the system is working, and we can come back to the empirical data to propose, for example, new experiments or new explanations of how this disease can be working. But we can also continue doing uh, more interesting stuff, for example, use the already calibrated, uh, hopefully validated model to do some treatment design and optimization by, for example, putting the system of equations uh, into an optimization algorithm and uh, with this tackle the problem of negative side effects of treatments and also in the line of the previous uh, talk, find early warning signals that tell us something about the uh, possible future states of a, a patient that hasn't yet uh, developed symptoms but which might, uh, who might benefit from um, uh, early treatment uh, and prevention. And of course, we can look back to redefine the system, either make it bigger or smaller or add more components or whatever and continue this whole loop uh, for many decades and even <laughs> a very, very long time. That's why we need plenty of students for that. So, uh, yes. Um, I will very, very, so when the goal is to, under, uh, for me in this talk, is for you to sort of understand this pipeline of what we do and why we do it. And I will very briefly give you some examples with the disease I've been working with. So the first of uh, them is atopic dermatitis, for which uh, for several uh, years and documented in different publications, um, some of them purely experimental as this last one, which is very nice. Um, uh, we built a model that helped us to identify mechanisms for disease onset, progression, and also prevention. So basically, the question here was to understand, as I told you before, so what causes the transition from healthy to severe uh, phenotypes passing through asymptomatic states from which we would like to apply preventive treatment 
to contain them in a healthy phenotypic space, how uh, to uh, design optimal treatments to go back to asymptomatic states with minimal amounts of uh, drugs, and importantly, characterizing the effects of uh, risk factors on uh, disease. So this is a result or summary of um, many years of, uh, of work, and it's not all of it, but just to give a, a glance. So we have, uh, we defined uh, the system, uh, integrating plenty of literature, building a hybrid model of differential equations with different time levels to be able to reproduce the dynamic uh, trajectory of, of the disease progression. With bifurcation analysis, we were able to identify the different uh, roles of risk factors on the disease progression. And once we have this model, we were able to characterize or look more closely at asymptomatic patient, virtual patient cohorts, to try to propose new early warning signals uh, that can uh, pinpoint or tell us about uh, um, patients that might benefit from preventive, uh, preventive strategies, which we also modeled and uh, with it validated uh, clinical data. Finally, we used this model to do some treatment optimization. This was done in, uh, with, from two different approaches one of them using uh, optimal control theory for corticosteroid uh, treatment of a very uh, severe uh, patient to try to contain it in a um, healthy phenotype, healthy-like phenotype, and also using bifurcation theory. And finally, uh, well, this was our collaborators, validated our model predictions with different animal models of this disease. So this is just to highlight uh, how such a model can be used extensively and the kind of um, clinical and also experimental implication it can have. So nowadays, uh, we have moved to a more uh, interesting, uh, well, from maybe a bit saddest uh, perspective, a more interesting disease, also concerning stratified epithelia, so just the skin. But now, um, more severe diseases such as uh, psoriasis and also concerning other stratified epithelial sort as uh, cervix and uh, um, cervical cancer. So what's the question there? So previously in atopic dermatitis, we had like a sort of mild phenotype which we wanted to explain and reproduce and so on and so forth. But now uh, we really want to understand how things can be really messed up. So. Atopic dermatitis patients don't really, um, well, they can more or less live with the disease, but sometimes things can go terribly wrong when the whole stratified epithelium fails to differentiate. So one big question is, um, how is this differentiation of stratified epithelium controlled? And most importantly, how can it be disrupted? And to address this question, we are using a combination, uh, well, again, uh, um, a combination of two different approaches, which we combine in a hybrid uh, model. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, delayed differential equations, which we use to model the dynamics of the population of different cells in the stratified tissue. And we use it to prove, and we could even analytically prove, uh, what is required for a healthy state of a uh, stratified system to be maintained or to be lost. And additionally, uh, well, here with uh, Jorge and uh, Jose Luis, uh, well, we or they, more they, have been uh, developing this uh, Boolean network to which lives, let's say, inside the individual cells to try to understand how the actual differentiation process is controlled at, in a transcriptional um, um, scale. And using this analysis together with other tools developed in Alvarez Buya lab, uh, partly by Jose who talked this uh, morning, we can answer questions about uh, how long this stratified tissue takes to recover and what are the functional and clinical implications from this. So this is um, ongoing work. It's really, really ex exciting and I think it will be able to answer many open, uh, clinically relevant questions. So it's quite nice. 
So then very quickly, uh, I will talk about two uh, infectious diseases that we have also uh, been tackling with this approach. So one of them is uh, pneumonia. And in this uh, system, basically, we want, in, with this model, we wanted to answer why some uh, host pathogen interactions between um, commensal bacteria sometimes get disrupted to lead to infection and sometimes even uh, sepsis. So for that, again, the same story. So we started by integrating plenty of quantitative data in this, um, this time, um, building a mathematical model, parameterizing it, uh, reproducing many different data sets, and then doing robustness analysis of the system, which is something which we would expect from a commensal bacterium, that normally it produces no phenotype, but sometimes yes. And then we wanted to understand when is this um, disease phenotype uh, being reproduced, and we answered this by sensitivity analysis. We validated our model predictions uh, with uh, experimental data also from those models. And finally, we used this model for minim minimization of antibiotics. So again, these results are already published, so if you have any questions, you can either ask or look at the paper. And currently, I'm working uh, also uh, on another infectious process, a bit more basic uh, science thing. Uh, it's about f uh, fungal infections and about how changes in oxygen leads to the uh, differentiation of this uh, type of um, uh, uh, fungal, which can, be, can trigger some disease in, for example, candida. And for this, again, uh, we integrated plenty of experimental data uh, from uh, t uh, three decades from an experimental collaborator, Dr. Uh, Hansberg, uh, integrated it into a hybrid model which was able to reproduce plenty of his data and data from other labs as well. And with this, we were able to, uh, the mathematical model to uh, reproduce the theory that he as an experimentalist previously had phrased only, well, in uh, words, so it gave like a, a good validation of hypothesis. Again, this is still uh, ongoing work. It's quite promising. We're w waiting now for uh, data, so to uh, calibrate the or look at the predictions. And finally, um, the last uh, model I want to talk to you about very quickly is a model about hepatocellular carcinoma, where our question was basically how uh, fibro pro-fibrotic microenvironment composed by inflammation and changes in rigidity of the um, uh, liver leads to, or, um, leads to the transition of a healthy epithelial tissue to mesenchymal cells which are uh, invasive. So, yeah, just to finish this. Um, uh, no, we can do this. But anyway. Um, Again, using Boolean modeling and epigenetic landscape analysis, we're characterizing this uh, perturbation. So in conclusion, uh, we look at diseases from a dynamical systems perspective, looking at disease trajectory as, uh, um, which can be, as a trajectory that can be modulated both by risk factors and by prevention and treatment strategies. Uh, I've talked to you about uh, these projects today, which um, can be used for data integration, robustness analysis, risk factor characterization, treatment optimization, and disease, uh, early disease markers. I want to thank again people involved in this uh, project, and if you have questions, you can ask now or later. <laughs> Bye.